And so everything we do, the, the values that we carry, are informed from a people that understand the, the authority and the rule and reign and the, of the kingdom of God and the power of the presence of God that is inherent amongst his people. And as those things come together, we recognize that it actually is the only way that Jesus' original mission is fulfilled. Is a people that recognize and understand who it is they are and what it is they carry. Well, hey, so yeah, we've been talking uh, the last several weeks going through, you know, essentially 10 values. We've sort of torn them apart a bit. We've, we've deep dived into some of them. We understand that 10 values are way too many. Uh, but, but we've broken these things up into 10. And we, we've, we've done that in order to say these are the values that the Vineyard Church, not just our church, but that the Vineyard Church globally, the Vineyard Church historically, that's been around for 50 years, a couple thousand Vineyard Churches all over the world, has had and and is continuing to move and continuing to grow rooted in these values. And we we understand that that nothing that we're going to do will violate these values. And we also understand that all of these values, we we understand none of them are are better than the other, that we hold them all equally and and we hold them uh, maybe in tension with one another. I'll just read you a real quick summary. Uh, we, We really value small groups here at the Vineyard. And so the point is, is like, if you hang out with us long enough, you're going to notice that we're, we're going to say like, hey, who are, you, who are you getting with outside of Sundays? Who, who, are you, who are you being with? Who are you sitting with? Who are you praying with? Because it's very possible, even in a room this size, to slip in and slip out uh, every Sunday and never actually be known, never actually be in relationship with one another, never actually have someone that can say, hey, um, what are you struggling with? How can I pray for you? Uh, how, how's your marriage? How's your family? How's your, how's your relationship with Jesus? How's your sinning? Is, are you still doing those? You, you can't, if you just slip in and slip out, right? We understand that this is not uh, supposed to be uh, a, a walk where we walk alone. That the idea of this faith is that it's supposed to be shared uh, with one another. So we value the small groups. We have small groups. We're going to constantly ask you to to get in a small group, and we're going to say, hey, if you have to pick between coming here on a Sunday because life's so crazy and your schedule's so busy, or a small group, pick the small group because that's where things are really going to start taking root and happening here. Uh, we value ministry to the poor, orphans, and widows, and so we're going to be thinking about continually looking for opportunities where the kingdom is at work amongst the poor, amongst the orphan, and amongst the widows. This is what the scriptures command us to do. And are we actually doing anything about it? Are we, are we thinking about them? Are we, are we going after them? Are we, are we looking for them in our men's? Are, are we keeping them? See, God loves the poor. He loves the orphan. He loves the widow. He's close to the broken is what the scriptures say. And so we, we want to love the things that he loves. And so even in Franklin, uh, we're, we're going to look for our, our, our brothers and sisters and our neighbors that, that may need more than, than they have. And we're going to minister to them. So we're going to value that. We value evangelism. And we, one of the other ones is missions and, and all of this. We, we value this whole idea. And if you were here last week at the 11 o'clock, you may have heard me say, we value the idea that this is not supposed to stay with us. That this gospel that, that we have, this Jesus that we love, the Holy Spirit that, that lives within us, it was never meant to stay uh, inside of us only. We're, we're called to actually go. We're called to, to go and to make disciples. And so again, you'll hear me and all of us begin to ask questions that will say things like, hey, how many dis- people are you currently discipling right now? How many people are you intentionally discipling uh, into a, a deeper relationship with Jesus? Which begs the question, are you? And if not, why? Because He's explicitly called us to do that. And if we're not careful, we can fill our our calendars and our schedules and our times with religious routines, with church activities that make us feel good. We can listen to Christian music, and we can can go to prayer events, whatever you want to do, and miss the actual things that he's explicitly told us to do. He's told us to make disciples. He's told us to go out. And so we're we're going to be a people that are constantly asking ourselves those maybe uncomfortable questions of saying, who are we reaching? Who who are we going to? Where is he sending us to? Uh, We value the authority of the Bible. We understand that nothing uh, can, can usurp this book. 
that, that no matter how we, how we function, no matter what culture says, no matter what, what is cool, what is uncomfortable, uh, the book went. We, we, value, we value the authority of scriptures, and, and that's going to fly in the face of everything, because God is holy, which means different. And so he, he is, his value set, his things that he likes, very anti-culture sometimes. Uh, very uh, anti our own comfort. But we submit ourselves to the authority of Jesus and to the authority of his word. Now this also means that we want to be a people that do things that the book says to do. So it's not just about not doing things that the book says not to do and, and, and judging other people that aren't doing that. That's obviously not the point. We are, we are looking at it f- through ourselves. And we're asking, first of all, am I violating any of the things that it's telling me that I shouldn't violate? And, and second of all, am I doing all of the things that it's calling me to do, like make disciples? And so we want to be a people of the book. And so everything that we do around here will come from that primary standpoint to become a people of the book. Just somewhere, someone actually living like this book tells us to live. So we, we value that. Uh, we value the idea of equipping the saints, this idea that we're actually all called to be ministers. Scriptures call it the priesthood of believers, that, that the job of this church is not for me to ask you to get all of your lost friends to come in here and I'll get them saved. You can do that if you want, but uh, I mean, don't not do it, but the, the goal is, is that you're supposed to be the ones that are going out and reaching the people. That, that God has placed us in spheres of influences. He's placed us amongst people and, and, in, and in neighborhoods and in schools and in communities and in offices that, that I can never reach and you can never reach. And so because of that, it's always been his plan that this become a viral movement that spreads amongst the people. And so the idea of this equipping the saints for the work of the ministry is that the way that we work here is that our job is, is to help uh, you accomplish the ministry that God has called you to. And we're all called to, to the ministry. We're all called to be kings and priests. We're all called to go and do the work that Jesus has called us to. And so we, we, we're against the separation of the holy and the secular. We realize that God's holiness prevails everything. And so uh, your, your church might actually be your office that you're pastoring. Uh, your, your congregation may be your family that you're homeschooling. And, but the idea is that he has called all of us to go. Uh, we value the uh, unity of the church. Uh, this is an idea that we say, like, we're not in competition with other churches. Uh, I, I don't have competitors that are other pastors. I have friends that are other pastors. And we're in ministry together, and we're, we're underneath the authority of the same king. And so if one church is succeeding, then we rejoice. And we, we, we realize and recognize that there's not enough churches, even in Franklin, and there is a ton of churches, but there's not enough to hold all the people if all of the people uh, encountered God and, and, and came in. And so we champion other churches. We're friends with other churches. We're not in a gang. If you leave and go to another church, we do not excommunicate you. It's a big family. And so we, we hold people loosely, we hold other churches loosely, and we recognize that we're on mission together. We're called to work together. Um, that doesn't count if they're heretics. <laughs> uh, we also have a value of healing the sick and casting out demons. Um, what this means is that we, we put a value on Jesus' ministry. Jesus has commanded us to do that. He commanded his disciples to do that. This was a part of uh, the New Testament church, the early church. It's been a part of the historical church uh, up until very recently. And so there's been this like, separation because of our modern Western uh, post, postmodern mindsets where we've sort of separated this idea of, of supernatural. But we, like, there's a cognitive dissonance there that the story of Christmas is supernatural, <laughs> right? Like, like everything about Jesus is real supernatural, and, uh, and sometimes we're, we're like, well, that's okay, but like, for us to engage uh, in, in the supernatural now, well, that seems strange. But it kind of is all supernatural. And so we understand that, that part of our mandate here is to actually begin to show that God cares enough about the individual person that's in front of us to intervene into their lives now and to bring healing 
uh, for the thing that ails them. If it's inner healing, if it's, if it's psychological healing, if it's traumatic uh, things that they've suffered, if it's physical things, we believe God actually wants to heal that, wants to intervene. We also believe that there's an enemy at work, that, that he roams around, like the scriptures say, like a, like a lion, to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. We, we understand that, that we're in a battle here, and, and that there are, there are forces at play, and we call them, like the scriptures, demons, and spirits, and principalities, rulers of the air. We recognize the fact that, that the enemy is constantly trying to pe- keep people in bondage and in slavery. And it's one of our mandates is, is to be like Jesus and to set the captives free. And so we don't shy away from that. We don't go looking for it necessarily. But, but when the fight is brought to our doorstep, we step in. And so we're not saying there's a demon behind every rock. But maybe every ten. We recognize that they're around. And, and they want to kill you. And they're trying to kill you. They want that, listen, Satan wants nothing more than to take you out, take your family out, take, take, take all of the things from you. That's what he wants. Steal, kill, destroy. But Jesus has come that they may have life. And he sent us to be messengers of life and hope. And so we engage in the battle when it presents itself. Uh, we value a commitment to world missions. Uh, we understand that we're supposed to think uh, not just about our neighbors here, but our neighbors across the world. We're supposed to think about uh, the persecuted church who are right now uh, dying. I, I'm a part of an organization. We've lost over 200 folks that have been martyrs, uh, that are leaders of house churches this year. And they've been killed in horrific ways for the proliferation of the gospel, for the work that God has called them to. And, and you know, we take our freedom way for granted here. And, and they don't have a choice. And this is like, just do a little plug here. Part of taking our freedom for granted is like this idea that Christians don't involve themselves with the election process and all of these sort of things. Like 40 million Christians don't vote. Vote while you can. Because I got a lot of friends that have no say and they're getting killed for Jesus. And so it's part, part of living in this country here and honoring them is to actually engage somewhat into our process. That's Tuesday, by the way. Um, but we recognize that it's, it's bigger than us here. And that if we're not careful, we can forget about what God is doing all over the globe. And, and listen, he is doing things all over the globe. It's incredible. Some of the biggest moves of God are happening right now in countries that are persecuting believers. The fastest growing churches in the world are growing in places like Iran, Afghanistan, Iraq, China. They're growing. And so we recognize here that, that perhaps God has called us to be the, the wealthiest Christians, the freest Christians that have ever walked the face of the planet in all of history, maybe to help further the mission of Jesus. Maybe to help him to extend the gospel of Jesus, not just to have great boats and vacations. And I want those things. But I think there's enough to go around. And that's what he's calling us to do. We value worship. We, we worship everywhere, all the time, no matter what. We, we have axe throwing on the men's night. We're also going to worship. We do, any time we gather and we call it a Franklin Vineyard gathering, we're worshiping. And we're going to continue to do that because we realize, A, it's the only thing that, that is actually valid as a response uh, to the understanding and the recognition of how good God is and how, how he has called us. And so we worship him because he's worthy. And we worship him because we understand and recognize that there's something that happens that pleases the Lord in our worship. And, and there's a chance that his presence could begin to come and rest. And, and the presence is everything. The presence of God is everything, and so we, we make ourselves available. So in small groups, and Bible studies, everywhere we do something, we're worshiping. And we're going to go even harder at that, because it's a core value of who we are in the vineyard. And then we value, we talked about it last week, we value this idea that we get to exercise spiritual gifts. We realize that God has not been struck silent since the closing of the scriptures, 
that God still speaks, he still moves, and he gives good gifts, and he gives them to us to do ministry to other, for other people. And so the spiritual gifts, we try to diffuse any weirdness around them. We try to be normal people. Uh, we understand that there's, there's uh, stigmas attached to all of these, but we want to be a people that say, look, again, we're just going to do what the book says. And the book says that those are for us, and so, okay, how do we do that? We understand that they're God's gifts, they're not our gifts. And he's giving them to us, and he's giving to us, them to us uh, for the use uh, for other people. And so, again, we're, we're just being a people that are submitted to the book. And this is all under the banner and, and the idea that we are a people submitted to the book, and the book is all about the kingdom of God. Jesus is, is constantly talking to us about the people of, and the kingdom of God. And so our, our views, our, our motivations, how we interact with the world is filtered through the lens of the gospel of the kingdom of God. Jesus talks about the gospel of the kingdom of God 61 times throughout the gospels. It, it was his gospel. And we understand that, that the gospel of Jesus is the gospel of the kingdom. And the gospel of the kingdom helps us to define and understand and navigate the world that we live in so that we will not be unaware, as the scriptures say, so that we can be more than conquerors, as the scriptures say, so that we can understand that the kingdom of God is at the heart of it is a clash between two kingdoms. That we have this enemy and we have God. Now, they are not equal in power. God is way stronger, like inf infinitely stronger. So it's not, it's not a battle of good and evil and yin and yang. No, no, no. The kingdom of God wins. And he's already won. But, but there are places that the kingdom of God have, has yet to prevail. And so part of what we are called to do is to, to look where the kingdom is at work and to go there and to partner there and begin to see the kingdom of God expand. And this all kind of centers back to this idea of what happened at the very beginning. Because we're people of the book. We're people of the whole book. We talked about this. Jesus really believes in the Old Testament. We went through that. Jesus quotes the Old Testament. He affirms the Old Testament. We, we understand that the Old Testament is, is, is worth our time. And so it all starts there, and it unfolds in this, in this incredible story of which we, we find ourselves a part of. And so it begins in Genesis, right? Remember in Genesis where, where God created the world? Remember that? He did. Jesus believed it, and so I believe it. And so he created the world, and uh, he created man, and he created man and woman in his image and in his likeness. We're going to read this in Genesis 1, 26 through 28. It says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so he created man in his image to, to, to bear his image and in his likeness and to function in his likeness. And so he, he created us to rule underneath him and alongside of him. Over this earth. And then we know what happened is that we have this interchange with the serpent and, and, and man fell. And they released, they, they stepped themselves out of the line of authority of, of God the Father. And they came under the authority of Satan and they began to play by his rules. The scriptures say, and sin entered, entered man and entered the world. And later on we see that Adam had a son, Seth. And the language is important because it says, and Seth was born in his image. And in his likeness. Adam's son Seth was born out of the broken copy, the broken humanity that was taking place in, in his father Adam. And so from Seth on, we have this broken copy reproducing other broken copies. And, and we have this, this idea that we have fallen short of the glory of God, is what the apostle says. And so we continued in, in that way, and, and, and we continue in that that stream, and then we have the story, right, of Noah, and again, we remember, uh, Jesus believes in Noah, so we believe in Noah, we, we talked about that, and we have, we have this idea of Noah, and then we have this idea of Abraham, and Abraham getting called out and saying, I'm going to make a people again, because the people were, were lost, they were separate, they were out, and God says, I'm going to make a people, and I'm going to give them a place, 
just like he originally intended in the garden. And he called it the promised land. And then hundreds of years came, and, and the people of, of God were enslaved in Egypt, and he sent his servant Moses, and Moses broke them out and let them free. And, and eventually they came into the promised land. You remember the stories of Exodus and Joshua? And so they come into this place that the Lord has set apart, and, and, and they come into this rule, and, and the scriptures are clear that they were not supposed to have a king. They were supposed to actually have God as their king. Right? Because, again, what is God doing? He's, he's reestablishing what was lost in the garden. He's, he's gathering a people again to come under his rule and reign. And, and yet, we see over and over again, because of the brokenness of sin that, that was inside of us, we just couldn't do it. And so, time after time after time, we fail and we fail and we fail. And he calls us back and he, he draws us in and, and, he, and he creates a place. Until finally, we, we recognize and we see that, that there's really nothing else we can do about this. That, that no matter what we try to set up, no matter how hard we work at it, that we're never able to truly live submitted to his rule and his authority. There is deep rebellion within us that needs to be dealt with. Can anyone save us? Could anyone deliver us from this? And we see this unbelievable thing of God stepping into history in the form of Jesus. And so Jesus comes, and he's born of a virgin. He's born outside of the sin sickness that we all carry. And he is born into a world and he comes and he comes with a new proclamation. And he says, listen, everything has been this way for a long time, but I call you to repent. And this word means to change the way that you think about things. Change the way that you view history. Change everything that you've ever known because the kingdom of God is at hand is what Jesus says. And so he steps into the scene and he announces something that the earth has been groaning for since creation, that now the kingdom of God is at hand. And the kingdom of God is no longer a place. It is a ruling and a reigning of King Jesus. It is a ruling and reigning where God's rule, his dominion, what he wills and what he wants happens wherever it happens. It doesn't have to be relegated to a place in the Middle East anymore. It's everywhere. He says things like the kingdom of God is at hand. It's, it's within you. It's, it's everywhere. And it's continuing to expand. We, we see here in Luke 9, 1 through 2, we, we see this thing where Jesus is now delegating this authority that he has uh, as being born of a virgin. He's carrying this authority and he says to his disciples, he gave them power and authority uh, to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And then he he extends it. And he extends it to the 72. In Luke 10, verse 9, he says, Heal the sick who are there and tell them that the kingdom of God is near you. And so why do we believe in in healing the sick and casting out demons? Because it is, is an example of what it looks like when people come under the rule and reign of King Jesus. That sickness no longer has a place in the kingdom. That demons no longer have a place to steal, kill, and destroy in the kingdom. That in the kingdom there is life and there is life to the full. That in the kingdom there is freedom. In the kingdom there is fullness of joy. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, joy. And where those things are are absent, we realize that, that the kingdom of God has yet to fully come here. Because we live under this paradigm where God, where Jesus came... And he established the kingdom, and he said the kingdom is at hand. And then we recognize that there is more kingdom yet to come. And so the kingdom is here now, and it is still coming. There's more. And this is why he commissions us, and he sends us. And in Matthew 28, it's his call. He says, Jesus says to them, and he said, this is after he rose, after he was crucified, before he ascended, he says... All authority, this is important because he's saying everything that was lost in the garden, this is why the scriptures call him the second Adam, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and in the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. 
And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Again, why do we spend our time talking about like healing the sick, casting out devils, uh, preaching the gospel to the poor, all that sort of stuff? Because he commanded his disciples, remember? It, uh, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and cure diseases. He sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. It's Luke 9. Luke 10, 9. Heal the sick uh, who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near. So what are they discipling us into? That. Yes, the Beatitudes, for sure. But also these. And so we, again, we're just believing the book. We're just doing what the book says. And so we want to... We want to continue to extend and, and to preach the gospel, to proclaim the, the story and the message that the kingdom of God is at hand, that God cares about your life, that he, his, his thoughts and his concerns actually are on things that are concerning you. I mean, part, part of the language that we continually use here is that God is not a theoretical mental ascent. He, he wants to intervene. Like his, his, the, the, the message of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom, is that God is here and he's present and he cares. And so we pray and believe that he actually cares about what you care about. Isn't that just, like, if we could just stay there, that's amazing. Like, we serve a God who is, yes, incredibly holy. I, again, I was just reading the story to the kids of Isaiah 6. Of the throne room. I mean, it is, it's a wild place up there. And, and, you know, that's the response, is to fall dead. But he also is highly caring, highly concerned. He's better than you think. He's kinder than you can even imagine. He, he cares more about what you care about. He cares more about your kids than you do. He cares more about your, your marriage than you do. He cares more about the things that are bothering you than you do. Like, that's unbelievable that we get to serve that kind of a God. And so, like, we have this idea and this belief as a people that, that not only are, are we called to, to serve him, but we're, we're called to tell other people. I mean, that's the good news. The good news is not a death cult that at some point you're going to die and you don't have to go to hell. You get to go to heaven. It, that's, that's part of it, but it's not the whole thing. The good news is that the hell that you're in right now can go. And when Jesus tells us to pray the prayer that, that his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven, it's a declaration to the enemy that hell's time is up. And so we go into the places that look like hell and we believe that God wants to see them transformed into heaven, into the kingdom. We actually have answers and solutions for people that are hurting, that are broken, that, that have, are riddled with with trauma and with pain and with disease and, and with regret and with bitterness. We, we carry the solution. It's called the kingdom. This is, this is how we function here. And this is why you, you're not going to see advertisements camp, campaigns about how good our coffee is. I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> if you see an advertisement campaign from this church, what it'll say is like, hey, are you sick? Do you want to get better? We believe God wants to heal you. Like any, any sort of messaging from this church is like, hey, we actually believe God wants to like intervene in your life. We believe that we can pray and see our prayers answered. We believe that we can, we can pray and actually see the intervention of God in, in people's lives. And I believe if the city believed that, like if, our, if our county and our neighbors, if they believed that, we would have no problem proselytizing this whole place because everyone's looking for that answer. Everyone wants their pain to be alleviated. And we actually believe God wants to do that as well. And so we, we press into that. But, but more than just the kingdom, we understand that involved in that story, you have, yes, the expansion of the kingdom, but in the center of the kingdom... Uh, God does something differently. Is he's not just restoring the authority and the rule and reign that was lost in the garden. He's also interested in restoring uh, the, the access to his presence. You see, in the garden, yes, they were given dominion, and yes, they were called uh, to go and to be fruitful and multiply, but they also literally walked with God. 
Like his, pre- like his presence. And when, you know, presence we, we sometimes can make ethereal, but presence is like, hey, we're together. It's friendship. It's, it's, it's there. And they lost that presence as well. But again, God is so kind. He decided not just to return uh, the, the kingdom and the rule and the authority and the mandate. He decided to return the presence as well. And so we see here in Exodus 25, where, where he's already called his people out and he's leading them into the wilderness. He says, not only am I, am I busting you out of your slavery and your captivity, not only am I bringing freedom to, to your enslavement to the bondage of sin and death, but I'm also going to reestablish my presence amongst you. And he says to Moses, he says, the Lord spoke to Moses in verse 1, saying, speak to the children of Israel that they may bring me an offering from everyone who gives it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. You skip down. The offering was so in verse 8. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show you. That is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings. Just so you shall make it. Several hundred years later, the tabernacle, the place that his presence dwelt, was replaced with a permanent temple. Right and, and, and the temple was there and, and it hosted his presence, the, the, the actual presence of God to where you, if, you could, if you strolled in there on the wrong time, at the wrong day, you're dead. Because his, his literal presence was there. And people would come from all over the world to encounter the living God at his temple where his presence was. We see in Isaiah 56, 7, what he calls uh, his temple he says, even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer, their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar. For my house, his temple, will be called a house of prayer for all the peoples. And through this temple, he manifested his love. He manifested his presence, not just for his people, but for everyone. And, and people would come, and, and they, would, they would come to his presence. The presence of God was there in the temple. And what happened again, just like with the kingdom, the people continued to rebel. This seed of rebellion continued to, to have them break. Uh, the covenants continued to have them like forget about the presence, f- forget about the idea that he's dwelling amongst his people, that he calls his people holy as he is holy. And, and what happens is the temple is eventually destroyed. And, and the people are in exile, and they're without their land, and they're without the presence. And they come back and they try to come back and they rebuild it, but it's, it never quite happens and they lose it again. And so the Hebrew text of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, uh, ends with far more questions than answers. And, and the questions are, is that what are we going to do? Because we've lost it. We've lost the authority. We've lost the kingdom. We've lost the place. We've lost the presence. And, and we see in Mal- Malachi 1, verses 10 through 11, he says, who is there even among you who should shut the doors so that you would not kindle a fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hands. For from the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. and every place incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering, for my name shall be great amongst the nations, says the Lord. And so we're ending with this story of a loss of the presence. God is... is Seemingly abandoned his people. That's what they think. And the question is, who? Right? Again, we come to Jesus. The fulcrum of the whole story. And Jesus comes, and, and, and John says this in his gospel when he's talking about it. It says in, in John 1, 14, The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The presence of God had returned. And it became flesh. It became a, a person like us and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as the, of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word uh, dwelt that John uses is a Greek word that's unique, and it's the same uh, thing as, as, the, uh, as the word tabernacle. So again, like in Exodus, we have God now tabernacling amongst us. His presence is tabernacling amongst us in the person of Jesus. We see uh, Matthew quoting Isaiah uh, 7.14. He says, Therefore the Lord himself 
will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so John and Matthew are now exclaiming to the people that not just the rule and reign of, of the kingdom is returned, but the presence of God is now back. The presence of the living God now dwells amongst us. Emmanuel, he's with us. I mean, the people have constantly been wondering, where is he? And Jesus shows up and he says, here I am. And so we, we understand that uh, the tabernacling of Jesus is, is unique. And so this is part of the deal. Again, we don't culturally, like sometimes we'll read over passages and not understand why like, all these people are getting so upset uh, when Jesus says something or when the disciples say something. It's like, what's the big deal? The big deal is that what he's doing now is he's saying, hey, because there was a real nice temple that was built. Like there was a real nice temple when Jesus was around. The problem was there was no presence. And so Jesus comes to people of real nice temples and he says, nah, I'm, I'm the temple. I'm the tabernacle. And, he, and John writes it in, in, uh, in chapter 2, verse 19 through 21. Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. And therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the words which Jesus had said. And so Jesus is coming now to a people, I mean, like, again, he's coming to the people, the the people of Israel, and they didn't have a temple. We just talked about it. And so now they finally have this temple. And they're wondering, like, do we pray harder? Do we we make more rules around us? Like, where's God's presence? And so Jesus comes on the scene, Emmanuel, God with us, and he says, look, that ain't the temple anymore. The temple is a person, it's Jesus. The presence of God is Jesus, and it, it's dwelling and walking amongst us. And we see this representation at the crucifixion. Right? Because at the crucifixion, what happens? Well, at the crucifixion, after he dies, the, the veil of the temple was torn completely from top to bottom. So this veil was, was there to, to protect people uh, from the presence. Like it was like a, a guard rail that you you could go thus far and not die, right? And, and it was a real thick thing. It was like, you know, we could go into it. It's like real thick. It's a big, big deal, big deal. And it separated, the veil separated the presence from the people. And so when, when Christ uh, was crucified and he died, the, the veil was torn in two. What, what was it meaning? It was saying like, no longer is the presence relegated to the temple. It's out. And with Jesus' crucifixion and his death, burial, and his resurrection, he he says something completely, this is where, you want to know why people are persecuting uh, the the, the early church? It's because now they're saying something so crazy. Okay, fine. If you want to say Jesus was the temple and that's where his presence left, okay, that's one thing. But now they're saying things like, now we're the temple. Now, now his presence now no longer dwells in, in the tabernacle or in the temple or in his son, but somehow, miraculously, he dwells with us? This is what was so revolutionary in Acts. I mean, this is what was so, I mean, it was heinous to so many of the people that were hearing it. It was blasphemous is what they were thinking. And yet, The disciples would walk down the street and their shadows would bring healing. Why? Because they embodied the presence of God. And we understand that authority comes from the rule and reign of Jesus and power comes from his presence. Like healing comes from his presence. And so here we have these mere mortals hosting the presence of God. That's unbelievable, unthinkable. It's Genesis, it's the garden. And we see here in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, Paul says it explicitly. He says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit whom is in you, whom you have from God, and who you are not your, and you are not your own? For you were bought with a price and therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. He's saying, like, don't you get it? And he's actually talking to them as they're in, like, sexual fornication and adultery and, like, prostitutes. And he's saying, you, you don't understand what's going on here. 
Like if the presence of God couldn't cross the veil and you couldn't enter in unless you did all of these things or else you would die and you're sitting here cavalierly joining your body which is also hosting the presence to a satanic prostitute? And I tell you, he says similar things to us today because we find ourselves in the same position where we just don't get it. He says like, how could you even think about doing that? It's because we have this, again, cognitive dissonance between who we are and the spiritual realm. It was the first heresy. It's called Gnosticism. And it was a separation between the physical and the spiritual that God never intended. God is hyper-concerned with with the physical nature of the earth. He created it, after all. And so because we divorce those two realities in our heads, we allow ourselves to do unspeakable things if we really understood the idea that the presence of God dwells within us. And he says this too, not just to you and not just to me, but the word here is all y'all. Don't all y'all understand that your bodies, all y'all's bodies is a temple? We, we, again, we're individuals. We're cowboys. We're Americans. But he's not talking to just one person. He's talking, we collectively, our bodies collectively, become the temple. In other words, he calls it the body of Christ. And this is why, again, he takes it so seriously. Like, whoa, you guys are entering into communion and some of you guys are sinning? Careful. That's why some of you are sick. And again, we just gloss over those things. But we don't understand that collectively, like a collective holiness is important if we really believe that we're hosting his presence. And so he tells us over and over again that we are his body. And so we are a people that host his presence. And we understand that whereas in ancient times the people would travel miles and miles to, to come to the place of the presence in the temple, but now because of Jesus and the Holy Spirit which dwells within us, the temples are called to go. So no longer do we have to ask the people to come to a place, but the people now go out to the places where the people are. Again, why are we crazy about getting out of here? It's because it was the plan. We don't invite people to the temple. We understand we are the temple. And the presence of God is with us. And wherever we step our foot becomes the holy of holies. Which means there's a, there's a recognition that the presence of God at any moment, especially when we're together, can break in like we see in the Old Testament. I mean, what if we believe that? What, what, if we, what if we actually committed ourselves to say, I'm just going, again, to submit myself to the authority of the Scripture and believe that when a few of us, maybe just two or three, come together in, in His name, that's one of them. That's one of the things in the book. There he is. So why, again, why do we think about small groups? We understand that this presence is there. Why do we not forsake the gathering together as some of you have? It's because we understand that his presence is there. And so everything we do, the, the values we carry, are informed from a people that understand the, the authority and the rule and reign in the, of the kingdom of God and the power of the presence of God that is inherent amongst his people. And as those things come together, we recognize that it actually is the only way that Jesus' original mission is fulfilled. is a people that recognize and understand who it is they are and what it is they carry. That we are a people of the future, from the future, the kingdom of God that is yet to come. And we carry the very presence of God that can come and inbreak into the lives of people. And so around here, all we're thinking of is how can we continue the mission of Jesus, which he holds up. And he's quoting in Luke 4, verses 18 through 19, he says this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he says that the gates of hell won't prevail against us as we go out into the hell that people have in their lives. And the recognition of the authority of the kingdom, the theology of the kingdom, all of these things that we're talking about, and the recognition of the power of the presence of God that's available within us, we bring those things to the gates of hell. And we watch them topple time and time and time again. 
and the hell of cancer and the hell of sickness and the hell of poverty and, and the hell of captivity and of bondage and of broken families and broken marriages, those gates of those hells stand no chance against the kingdom and the presence. And so we devote everything we do here to be a people underneath the authority of the rule and reign of King Jesus, recognizing that we're carrying the presence of the very king that we serve. And there is nothing that can stop it. And so like David, we can say, who is this Philistine? I mean, who in the world do, do, do these people think they are? And again, Paul's real clear. It ain't people. It's the powers, the principalities. And so we see, again, when we look out into the world, and I don't know if you've looked out recently, but it don't look good. And as we look out and we see the hell of the powers and the principalities, we can say confidently, because we understand and believe the book, that who are these uncircumcised Philistines? Who are these elemental spirits and these demonic forces and, and the enemy of, of God? Who are they? For the Lord has delivered us from Egypt. He's delivered us from sin and death, from the lion and the bear. And he will deliver us from these. And so we will become agents of his deliverance wherever we go. And we can enter in to this Maranatha cry of even so, come Lord Jesus, come back, return. One day we understand that there will be a finality and a close to this age in which everything will be made right. This is what Paul says in, in Philippians 2, verses 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. And we recognize that until that happens, there's work to do. And, and as long as we're sucking wind, we have work to do. And we work to see the, the, the kingdom and its power and its authority and the presence of God begin to become proliferated, proliferated throughout the entire world. So there's always more to do. There's always dreams to be dreamt. There's always people that need freeing. And we understand that we're not responsible for any of those, that it's the Lord at work. And it's his rule and his reign and his power and his presence and his spirit. And he's inviting us into his story. And so this is the story of the vineyard. It's the story of a people that have said yes to his story. Yes to the fullness and the breadth of Scripture. Yes to the fullness and the breadth of the call. Yes to, to the mission of Jesus. Yes to, to the understanding of his spirit, which is, which is allowing us to partner with him. This is, this is who we are. And everything we do will continue to point to those realities and continue to become ever-present in our lives. And so as we work to extend the rule and reign of King Jesus. Now you're good. I don't need it. You're good. As we work to, to extend the rule and reign of King Jesus and to host his presence, we will begin to, to, to become the people that God has called us to be. The people of the garden. And this is why in Revelation we see at the end, we see the tree again. And we see the fountain and the river flowing out. And so we're people on our way back to the garden. And I can't get past this message. I can't, I can't think of anything I'd rather do. I continue to, to meet people that are bound in chains of their own doing sometimes, sure. Of the enemy. And you know when I sit with them? Because they ask me to sit with them. Because they've heard that maybe there's a chance that they could actually get free of some stuff that they could actually stop the hell that they're encountering. And when I sit with them, I never have to argue. I never have to convince them about Jesus or, you know, post-trib, pre-trib, all the things that we get caught up on. The only thing that they care about 
is, is there a God that sees me, that knows me, that can do anything about the hell that I'm finding myself in? And I get to bring the, the wonderful answer of yes. It's amazing. And so we're, we're continuing in that mission here, and everything that we do is going to be pointed towards that mission. And so as we close, what, I, what I'd like to do is I'd like to just allow the Lord uh, to begin to speak to us, and um, us as in you, and uh, like not all, like maybe he speaks. Uh, we're always open to that. Uh, but, but just allow the Lord to just begin to, to speak to us because the Lord is wooing and he's calling and he's, he's bringing us in more to his story. He's inviting us deeper into to the story and some of us have just read the introduction for our whole lives. He's like, it's time, time to turn the page. And some of us have, have felt like the Lord has, has passed us by and we, we may find ourselves like a people that, that, that have not experienced the presence of God in a long time. And we wonder, where is he? And he wants you to know he's here. And he's especially here with all y'all. And then some of us are, are finding ourselves in, in a place where we're, we're, we're feeling powerless and, and pitiful and there's nothing we can do. And is, will anyone come and, and rescue us from, from this pit of hell that we find ourselves in? And the Lord wants to remind you, yes, he is here. 